We'll continue our overview of Java by giving a summary of some of its key object-oriented concepts and features. Although we'll be focusing largely on functional programming in these lessons, it's important that you have a grasp of its key object-oriented concepts and features as well. Java was originally conceived of and developed as an object-oriented programming language. It therefore supports key object-oriented concepts and features, including data and control abstraction, which supports well-defined application programming interfaces and shields programs and programmers from low-level implementation details. It also supports inheritance, which enables the systematic reuse of existing methods and fields defined in superclasses. And it also supports something called polymorphism, also commonly known as dynamic binding. And this allows the dynamic dispatching of methods based on runtime type information. Object-oriented applications that are written in Java are organized in terms of certain structural elements. These include things like classes, interfaces, and packages, which I'm sure you're familiar with, hopefully from learning other parts of Java earlier. An object is an instance of a class that performs certain operations and often interacts with other objects. You can think of a class as basically being the cookie cutter and an object as being the cookie that's made with the class. An object in Java resides in a memory location of a computer. Here's a very simple example that we'll take a look at later called simple set. And we'll use that as our guiding discussion here. As you can see, simple set is a class. It's a generic class, which means it can be parameterized by the elements that are part of the set. And it consists of several parts. It consists of state, which is represented via data fields, things like M element data, M size, M end, and so on, as you see in this simple UML structure diagram. And data fields are typically specified using the private access control specifier keyword in Java. So you can see that we have these fields defined with private, meaning that they can't be accessed directly by clients of simple set. They also have behavior. So classes and objects that implement those classes or instantiate those classes have behaviors. And these, of course, are represented by methods. We can see we have several methods defined here, add, contains, size, and so on. Methods also can be specified as private, protected, or public. So you can see size is a public method. You can see is empty is a public method. However, we have a private method called ensure capacity internal that's only intended for use by the implementers of the simple set, not by clients or users of simple set. When you do object oriented design, you typically try to have the objects correspond to some sort of real world entity, whatever your world may be, whatever domain you happen to be operating in. So for example, if you were developing something that was going to be used for say the financial services domain, banking or so on, you might define an account class or an account object. And that object might have certain fields like the current balance and perhaps a Boolean to indicate whether overdraft protection is enabled on this account or not. And then it also might define a number of methods which provide behaviors that are available for users of this particular abstraction, this account. So you might be able to deposit money, you might be able to withdraw money, you might be able to check the current balance and so on and so forth. Non-object-oriented programming languages such as C or Fortran typically organize applications in terms of so-called functional elements or often known as procedural elements or subroutines. These often focus on actions and on logic. So they're often described with things like state diagrams and control flow diagrams and state charts and so on. Of course, object-oriented languages like Java also perform actions and contain logic, things like the deposit method or the withdrawal method or the check current balance method that we see in the account class. However, these functional elements that we have don't constitute the main design focus in the object-oriented portions of Java. So when you build your architecture, when you build your design, when you structure the way the various elements and classes and objects interact, it's typically through application programming interfaces, classes and objects, as opposed to through actions. Now, what's ironic about this, of course, is that with Java 8 and beyond, what we come, what we'll sometimes call modern Java, does start to focus on functional programming features again. And when we get to that part, we'll talk about how the functional features in Java work very nicely with its object-oriented features. They each have different roles and responsibilities they play to write well-designed and well-implemented programs, since Java, of course, is a hybrid programming language. 
There are, of course, many, many object-oriented languages these days. Uh, Java, C++, C Sharp, Python. These are some of the most commonly used ones. And I apologize if I left off your favorite. Uh, there was only so much room in the slide, but things like Java, C and C++, not so much C++, of course. It's not so much C, rather, but C++, Python, JavaScript. And what you'll find is that if you take a look at the link at the bottom of the slide, these languages tend to battle it out for dominance over time. But they're all still very popular. They're also, interestingly enough, all becoming hybrid languages, much like Java is. Now, it turns out that once you know Java, it becomes much easier to learn other languages. So you can learn other object-oriented languages, like Python, if you know Java, or C++. Uh, of course, you can also learn functional programming languages once you understand Java's functional programming features, which we'll be talking about here shortly. Now, if you know Java really well, then some parts of the discussions may be a little boring. But in that case, you can move through the material fairly quickly and focus on the parts where perhaps you need more coverage. Might be things, for example, like, say, method references or some of the interesting functional interfaces we'll be talking about here shortly. Make sure you ask questions on the material. You can post it to various forums. You can post it to YouTube and so on. And I'll be more than happy to answer questions that I see posted in a way that I can respond to them. Now, if you don't know any Java at all, then you may need to get some more hands-on experience. And if that's the case, I recommend you take a look at our Coursera MOOC, which you can enroll in no, at no charge, called Java for Android. And you can find that at the link in the bottom of the slide. And that has lots of material to really get you over the learning curve for some of the foundational object-oriented features of Java. Classes, methods, things like interfaces and inheritance and dynamic binding and conditional statements and loops and all that good stuff. So this is the end of our very quick overview of key object-oriented concepts and features in Java. I suspect you probably know all of this material already, so I'm not going to belabor it. And from here on in, we're gonna be delving much more deeply into the more interesting parts of modern Java, which of course are the functional programming features and concepts.